last week after the sermon, me and Beth were on the way home and, and she was just, we were chatting about it and she goes, you know, that was kind of a long sermon last week. <laughs> said, yeah, it was. She said, you know, it really didn't have a lot of Christmas cheer to it. And I said, well, no, it didn't. Uh, she said, but it was a good sermon nonetheless. And so I, I know that today you will rise up and call her blessed because this sermon should not be as long as last week. Uh, <laughs> And she'll, she's got the look now she'll give me when I start running too long. <laughs> but last week we talked about Christ's role as priest and what that meant for us and the significance of, that Christ as our priest, that Christ was the one who takes away our sins and that he did it once and for all. And so we saw how important that was for us. We saw the week before how Christ is the prophet, the last prophet of God, the final word, the word become flesh who dwelt among us. And it was in that that word, that Christ coming to us where we heard Christ's final word. Today we're going to take a look at Christ as king, his office as king, and we're going to see what that means. And I hope that today will be a very practical sermon for you. We're going to look at Christ as king and realize that Christ came in a way that was different. His kingship is one that is different. Now, ultimately, his kingship is going to be one that reigns forever and is glorious and all of that, but, it's, but he came in a way that was significantly different than everyone had anticipated. In order for us to get at what I want us to focus on today, I'm going to take the scripture that we're going to look at, which is Philippians 2, 1 through 11, and we're going to start at the end and work our way back. We're going to, to look at verses 9 through 11 first, then we're going to look at the middle section, and then we're going to look at the, at the first part of it. But let's go ahead and take a look now at Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So when we think about a king, what comes to mind? When we think about a king, we think about words like regal, and strong and perhaps demanding. And in that day when Jesus came as our king, but he came as a child, which was certainly out of the ordinary, the kings of that day were kings who were, were not very stable, if you will. If you go and you read through the Old Testament and you read of the kings there, even into the book of Acts, you see how the kings were, were not stable men and they, would, they acted on their whims and they, they did what they wanted to do whenever they wanted to do without care or regard for anyone else. Yet Jesus came and his kingship was one that was going to be totally different. He was going to come and we're going to see in a moment that he came as a servant. In fact, he came as a babe in a manger. But, the, but Paul tells us that even though he came as a babe in a manger, even though he did not do the things that we would expect the earthly kings to do, he said that there's going to come a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. In other words, there's going to come a day when every person who has ever lived and whoever will live will bow a knee to Jesus Christ and call him Lord. Or they will recognize him as Lord. They will recognize him as king. They may not like him. They may not agree with him now. may not believe in him at all. But they will have to confess someday who he was. In fact, if you remember at his death on the cross, the, the centurion who put the plaque above his head that said, uh, King of the Jews, there was a centurion, a pagan, a Roman, who recognized that Jesus was who he said he was, that he was King of the Jews. And so there is going to come a day, futuristically, when everyone will bow the knee. There's also going to come a day in the future when Jesus will reign forever. He will be our king, we'll see him as king, we'll know him as king, and we'll recognize him as king. And there won't be any un misunderstanding about who he is and what his role is. He will be our king, and he's going to be our king. In fact, you could say that even now that Jesus is our king. If you read what Paul says about the lordship of Christ, where Paul <coughs> says that Christ comes and lives in us when we accept him as savior, that Jesus comes to rule in our hearts. In fact, he comes and takes up residence with us. He gives us a new nature, and he gives us all sorts of new things, and he is the one to whom we are to internally bow the knee to already. We're to live in obedience to our king, the one who lives inside of us, 
and by his word has told us what he expects. And so even today, we live under that lordship, if you will, of Jesus Christ. I have a little baby right here that is just, just threw up looking at me. That, that was not where I was going with that. <laughs> he was so into the sermon, it just got him. <laughs> he got excited, yeah. He's been staring at me the whole time. It's just a little... Un- That's a sheep. <laughs> He's a good-looking girl. <laughs> okay, let's move on then. <laughs> Um, so what does it mean that Jesus is king from his perspective? And this is where I want you to think about him coming in a way that was quite different and him doing something that was quite different than what we would anticipate. In Philippians 2, 5 through 8, listen to what it says about Jesus. It says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So Jesus, when he came to dwell among us, when, as we saw a uh, few weeks back, and we looked at the, first, the John 1 passage, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, God became flesh, God took on human flesh, and became one of us. But Paul says something very interesting about God, and this is a part of of God that we sometimes, God in Christ, that we sometimes don't think about, and that's his humanity. Paul says that when he came, he laid aside his attributes of, of Godship, if you will, of who he was, those attributes of omniscience and, and omnipresence and omnipotence. He laid those aside. And what that means is, is that Jesus chose willingly not to use those attributes, those things that he could have used so that he could come and be one with us, so that he could experience humanity the way that we experience humanity. In fact, Luke tells us that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Now, what does it mean that Jesus grew in wisdom? It means that he learned things. You see, when we think about Jesus, we don't think that Jesus ever learned anything because he was God, he knew it all. But he willingly laid aside that so that he could learn, so that he could be like us. He grew in stature means he grew physically. Grew like we grow, he grew physically. So Jesus was able to understand, and that's why last week when we looked at Hebrews, when we were talking about his priesthood, that he was tempted in every way that we're tempted, yet he was without sin. He was able to live with us, for us, die for us, be seated at the right hand of God the Father for us, so that we then could have a Savior who understands the things that we go through. Now that's very different than any other kingship that you'll think about. For the most part, when we think about kings here, it isn't that they can understand us, it isn't that they are one with us, it's because we think of them as ruling over us, not being with us. And yet that's exactly what Jesus did when he came to be with us. Jesus was born of Mary. He was born, think of that. God of very God, the one who created, became one who was created. He went into the womb of Mary, this peasant girl. Think about that. That's incomprehensible in a way. And you know what? Just like the little girl here threw up a minute ago, Jesus threw up. He dirtied his diaper. He did all of those things that children do. He laughed. He cried. In fact, it says that he was tempted. And he experienced anxiety. Anyone ever experienced anxiety? or stress, Jesus experienced that. In fact, it says in the Garden of Gethsemane that, he, that when he was praying, that it was like drops of blood coming off of his head because he was under such stress. And in fact, because he willingly laid aside his omniscience, it says that he prayed, Father, let this cup pass from me. Let what's about to happen to me be taken from me if you'll let it. Jesus didn't know exactly, perhaps from a human standpoint, that he was going to the cross. He understood that that was the possibility, but because of his humanity, because he knew that God could change his mind, because he knew that God could rescue him, he willingly said, but I'm going to be obedient to you. Now think about that in relation to a king. That is not what we expect a king to be. The king is the one who's putting the people to death, not the one who's saying, take my life for my people, if that's what you want to do. Now, 
a few weeks back, when John did the overview of this series, he talked about two roles, if you will, of a king. One is to provide for his people, and the other one is to protect his people. And so if you think about Jesus' kingship, that one of the things that he's supposed to do is provide for us. And in fact, we know that he provides for us. In fact, the Bible tells us that he provides, for, provides us everything we need to live for him. But he also protects us. And the imagery that John used was the image of a shepherd, how the shepherd with that staff protects his sheep. Jesus protects us in, the, in this life that we have. So because he provides for us, because he protects us, because he went to a cross for us, because he reigns in heaven for us, because he sits at the right hand of the Father for us, because he intercedes for us, we have a king that we can trust. Unlike the kings of the days that Jesus lived, who were untrustworthy, who would, would change their mind on a whim, Jesus is always there for us. You see, Jesus' focus is you and I. Jesus' focus is on those who trust in him. And so because of that, we have a savior, a king, if you will, who we can, who we can trust in. So then what does it mean for us that Jesus is this king, that Jesus is this kind of king? Well, listen to the first four verses of Philippians 2. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any aff affection and sympathy, Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord, and of one mind. Amen. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. So now, Paul, at the beginning of chapter 2, tells us, how we should respond to what we heard in the middle and the end of, or, of the verses that I read up to chapter 11. We follow the king's example. We do what the king did. In fact, what did Paul say we do? He says we care for one another. He says that we care for one another, and Jesus said you care for one another as he's cared for us. We love one another as he's loved us. You see, when I read those words, I was reminded of what Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter. Remember what he said and how he said we were to, to treat one another? Listen to what he says. He says, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Now, I want you to think about something in relation to this passage, and I'm going to leave it up there for a moment. In 1 John, he tells us that God is love. So then how does God respond to us? God is patient and kind. God does not envy or boast. God is not arrogant or rude. God does not insist on his own way, is not irritable or resentful. God does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. God bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. God never ends. I mean, think about reading that passage that way. All of these characteristics, all of these attributes that Paul says that we are to develop in our life are the characteristics and qualities that our king displays towards us. I mean, shouldn't that make you change the way you think, perhaps, about what God does? I mean, remember, when he was our prophet, as we saw a few weeks back, he came to us to tell us who he was and what he was going to do. He told us that he was the king, basically. He was the fulfillment of the prophecies. All of the Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled in him. As our priest, he said, I'm going to forgive your sins as far as the east is from the west and remember them no more. I will forget something. The only thing that I will forget is your sin. But not only that, not only will I forget that, I'm going to sit at the right hand of God the Father so that you can draw near to me. You have a God who says, come to me. You don't have a God, a king, who says, you need to go through somebody. You need to go talk to this person or that person, and maybe they'll let you come talk to me. But we have a God who says, look, who sits on the throne, who is king, who says, come to me, boldly come to me, 
If you have trouble, come to me. If you need to speak to me, come to me. In every situation you find yourself in, come to me. Come boldly to my, into my presence so that you can receive mercy. Amen. That's a different kind of king than what we hear about or read about in this world. And then today, he gave us an example to follow. Compassion, kindness, love, generosity, all of those things. One of the things that Georgie mentioned in the prayer time was all of those people that, who don't have enough food to eat right now, who perhaps there will be no presents under the tree, who go, go without food. And, and we know a lot of our school children, when breaks happen, they don't get fed. And it's only when school's in session that they actually have food to eat. And there's so many kids that are not going to have this holiday season. There's going to be so many people who won't enjoy a Christmas like most of us will. Maybe we can show kindness. Maybe we can show generosity. Reach out. Find someone that you can reach out to. Remember that when Jesus, our king, when he came, he humbled himself in the form of a human being. He didn't need to be like us, but he chose to be like us. He lived, he died, he rose, and he reigns for us as our king. Because he's our king, because we are, we are subjects of his kingdom, we should emulate him. He came, he did, he gave. That's our prescription too. Go, do, give. That's what we should be doing this Christmas season. So I want to encourage you, I want to challenge you to find ways that you can do these things. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we thank you that you are our reigning king, that there is none like you, there is none but you. And Father, all of the things that you are to us, May you give us the ability to give those things to others. Thank you for the privilege of, of being your sons and daughters. Also the privilege of having so much that we can give to those who have so little. We pray your blessings now as we continue in our worship of you. May our hearts be warmed by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray.